All right, church, I get to introduce you to Joanne Lyon today. A little bit about Joanne. She was the first female general superintendent of the entire Wesleyan denomination. She holds multiple degrees, including five honorary doctorate degrees. She's an author, a professor, a friend, a mentor, a coach. Um, she's been really active in my own ministry life, and I don't know that I would be doing what I'm doing today without her. But also what you need to know about Joanne. Well, aside from the fact that she is the best storyteller, I know, um, I can text Joanne, you could text Joanne, and she would respond to you. And the reason that's amazing is because she also will simultaneously be talking to presidents of other countries because she is so widely internationally known to be a uh, lover of the Lord, to be someone that serves, to be someone that gives of herself, and she genuinely loves people. And she said yes when I invited her to come speak to you. Know that she is standing before you full of the Holy Spirit, anointed by God, one of the most groundbreaking, foremost leaders literally in our world. So church, would you join me please in welcoming Dr. Joanne Lyon. for those wonderful words. But I want to tell you, I worshiped the Lord this morning. I know you did too. What a wonderful worship team. And they led us to the throne of God in a wonderful way. And as, they were, as we were singing about Jesus, it came to my mind, I well remember, I was in Eastern Europe shortly after the wall came down. And I was with some people from Hungary and they said, you've got to know, for 50 years, think about this, 50 years, we would whisper as we would pass each other on the street, Jesus. You see, they had to whisper it or they would die. Jesus. And after that wall came down and freedom came, tens of thousands of them went to the stadium and they said for, for I didn't even know how long before they even started singing and doing anything, they just shouted, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. I want to say this morning, as you were singing this morning, it was so well done, it led us to that. I, just, I couldn't help but think of that, what the people had said, and we have the privilege today to shout it, Jesus is Lord, and he is Lord in our lives, he's Lord over everything, and so please remember what we have and keep shouting it, and you are the people that can shout it, Jesus is Lord. It's great to be with you today, and I, I follow you. Uh, and I listen to Heather's sermons, and I just want to say I love the way Heather can bounce down these stairs and bounce back up. I used to be able to do that, but you could tell I had to have Steve help me up the steps this morning. But I want to say that God is still, still alive and still working. Today I want to talk about what is in your hand. But I want us to take a look at this scripture first. This is our second Corinthians. I've got to get my tears away and my ma mascara is already rolling down my face here. Um, this uh, text that is from second Corinthians uh, six, ninth chapter, verse eight. And I want us to take a look and I want to get the context of this. Read it out loud with me. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Now, I'm sure there's some Greek scholars here today, but I'm just gonna let you know, what does all mean in the Greek? It means all, <laughs> all, everything. The context of where uh, Paul is writing this, he wrote this not to you and to me individually, but he wrote this to the church in Corinth. That's you. The body of believers, and I love the way uh, the people just mentioned about middle school. Yes, middle school is the church. They're the church. You know, God placed this church on this earth 2,000 years ago, the church of Jesus Christ, to do all that we can do and be around the world. And the church at Corinth, he was, a, he was telling them this entire, when you read the entire chapter, 
9 of 2 Corinthians, he's praising them for their generosity. After all, they had come together and they were sending money to the believers up in Macedonia that needed some help. And he's praising them for their generosity all the way through. But have you ever thought about who the people were in the church at Corinth? See, we read that and we think, well, they're all these nice little people. No, no, no. The city of Corinth was a center, actually, there was a, a temple there for uh, the, the, the fertility goddess Aphrodite, big temple there, a thousand prostitutes at that temple. There, there, this was a center, uh, Corinth was, was uh, a, a, a crossroads with the sea. And uh, so there were people from all nations that came in there. People who brought in all kinds of religions. There were people there who were from the cult, all kinds of, of cults uh, and goddess and goddess worship. There, was a, there were groups there from the cult of Dionysus. Dionysus was a cult. They generally worshiped in the forest. They, were, they, were, they would get drunk. He, were called the God, he was called the god of wine. And they would get drunk. And they did all kinds of orgies. And, and they had cross-dressing and all this kind of thing. Nothing new that we have today was there. These are people that found Jesus, and they're part of the church. That's the church, my friends. These are the people that he's talking to in the church in Corinth. This is made, made up of the people. And there were Corinth, the city of Corinth was very divided between the rich and the poor. The rich wanted nothing to do with the poor. Well, guess what? When they found Jesus, the rich and the poor came together in the church at Corinth. And when you read the book of Corinthians, both of those letters to the Corinth church, you will find Paul talking about all of these things, all of these, all of these sins, all of these kinds of things. And, this, and, and I love it in there. He says, he names a bunch of things. And he says, as some of you were, but no longer. You're not carrying that name anymore. You are, part, you are a Jesus person. You're part of the way. You're a Christ follower. That's what cri Christian means. They didn't know what to call Christians, actually, in chapter 11 of Acts. And that's where the, the believers were first called Christians. The disciples were first called Christians. Why? Because they were from, they'd never seen anybody like this. There was no religion, or the pagan religions were all monoethnic. And here we find at Antioch, there were from all different ethnicities. All different ethnicities. And Antioch was in Syria. Actually, I've been there. Uh, and I sat in a seat that they said, Peter sat in, I don't know, I doubt that, but anyway, I sat in it. Uh, and, uh, uh, but I, as I stood there that day, 30 years ago, in that place, by, by the way, it was just destroyed in the last earthquake that happened in Turkey. They read through those lines, and now that's in Turkey. But as I sat there that day, I thought, how interesting. They just used that name. Do you know what? Christian meant little Christ. Little Christ. They didn't know what else to call it, just little Christ. And here we are 2,000 years later, the great Christian. And it's about everybody. It's about every person that comes to believe in Christ because it was different. It wasn't the same. And today, my friends, it's still the, it's, this is what the church is about. It's everyone we believe, everyone is redeemed and can come and follow Jesus. Well, as we look at this text, I want to say this to you church at Madison Park. God is able to bless you abundantly you you church so that in all things that's individually and a body you got it we're individuals but as a body in all things at all times having all that you need you will abound in every good work that means we 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 care we care about people. We do kinds of things. I find it very interesting in uh, some studies and if, when you read about John Wesley and all that happened in England, uh, the great revivals that took place throughout England, but also it changed the culture. It changed society. It lifted up the poor, did all kinds of things. And uh, in fact, historians tell us that the, that the great revivals in England saved England from the bloody revolution of France. Now, how can that be? That, because that's the power of God that transforms lives. We're in the process of constantly being transformed. It isn't just forgiven. We're forgiven. But we move on through the Holy Spirit to continually be transformed. That's what we're about. The continued transformation. Not just 
well, my sins are forgiven. No, no, no. The great song says he breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoner free. He sets us free. We don't have to go back to that old sin anymore. He sets us free from that. He gives us a new name, and we move forward from there. It was interesting. An anthropologist did a study regarding those, the uh, um, revivals and how the culture was changed. And if you remember, the last letter John Wesley wrote was to Wilberforce to continue on to break the slave trade, the most evil thing that had ever happened. And ultimately, the slave trade was broken. And we've had, and then slavery, et cetera. But one of the things that this anthropologist studying, he finally said he couldn't figure it all out. Why the good works that the people did, the, the, those new believers in the revivals of, of, of Wesley. Finally, he says this statement. He says, it must be, and I love this, the mystical power of sanctification makes benevolent motives work. Do you get that? It's the cup of cold water given in the name of Jesus that's a different cup of cold water. There's power with that cup of cold water that's given. And as you're doing your work throughout the city and throughout the world, and as these young people go to, go to Ireland, I love that. They are being peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. They're going there as peacemakers. I find that interesting also. It's the only beatitude where Jesus says that you'll be called the children of God. <laughs> Peacemakers. What you are doing is different because you're doing it with the power of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Well, as we look at our world today, sociologists tell us that we live in a rootless, lonely, and restless world. I was out in South Dakota a few weeks ago, at, and generally people out there have kind of been there for all their life, and it was in Sioux Falls, actually. And I asked, how many people here are not from here? I was stunned at this congregation. Over half raised their hand. Yeah, rootless. We're, we move all the time. I'm rootless myself. Lonely, it's interesting that the UK has now determined that loneliness is such a disease, and I think we've already talked about it here, as a health problem. Loneliness is such a health problem and a disease in the UK that they've put an entire part of the government on loneliness, and they've appointed a minister of loneliness. Now, friends, I want to tell you, the church and community, as you've already talked about this morning, is the answer to loneliness. The power of the Holy Spirit that binds us together, that's what the church community is about. It's open arms, it's welcoming, it takes care of loneliness. The power of the Holy Spirit does that. And then restlessness. We're restless. Let's get this, let's get that. And I tell you what, phone, iPhones, and I know I'm guilty as well. Got to check this, got to check this. Oh, how many likes did I get on this? How many did I get this? Da, da, da. Did somebody respond? Oh, what if they didn't respond? Oh, something must be wrong if they didn't respond. God, you, you hear me on that? I don't care how old you are. <laughs> We're out there on that. That creates restlessness in our spirit, friends. I mean, I know. I felt restless in my own spirit. And wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I can't get caught in this. Lord, help me. And that's right. As we walk with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit checks us. We listen to that. Okay, okay. I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll work on that. I'll work on that. That's, that's part of growing. That's part of growing, constantly being constantly transformed. Restlessness. Well, they also tell us that we now live in a complex world. Previously, it was complicated world. So we've moved from complicated to complex. So what's the difference? Well, complicated means that we can uh, connect the dots, like an assembly line. We can do this and this and this and this, and ultimately, we can connect the dots. But complexity means that it's, we have to look at what's happening and adapt. I don't mean we accept, but we move with what it is. We can't always connect the dots. We're still trying to figure out what that means. Then. Comfort zones. We've, in all of this, we'd rather just be in our comfort zone. But I want to tell you, your comfort zone keeps you from developing. 
you will not grow in your comfort zone. And then we have a myth that says, well, if, I'm every, if everything is, life is going good if, if I feel good, but life is, if I don't feel good and things are not, I'm not feeling good, then things must be wrong. No, sometimes we don't feel good, but things are right because God's calling us beyond what we can control. And I want to tell you, that's faith. That's when we trust God. That's when the greatest things happen. When we move on out beyond things that we can control. I just want to say a couple of things. The Holy Spirit is at work in the midst of all of this. Do you know where the fastest growing church is today? Underground church in Iran. Fastest growing cell groups underground in Iran led by young women. None of that makes sense, does it? None of that makes sense in that country. I've also had the privilege of, of twice I've met, had the privilege to meet with Iranian religious leaders. We met in Switzerland. Now these were um, uh, ayatollahs and clerics. And do you know what they asked me to present with them? Was the first time was how do Westlands, and I remember saying to the person who asked me to do this, and this is a part of the Nobel Peace Prize people in Catholic University Law School, et cetera. And they said to me, no, West, I said, Westlands, oh my goodness. That's a long way from Shia Muslim. They won't even know what I'm talking about. No, I want you to talk about how Westlands believe, that would be you too, Church of God, all of us in this, this, this tradition, believe and practice the words of Jesus in caring for the least of these. And I thought, wow, okay. Well, God help me. Holy Spirit help me. And, and I talked about Jesus. I talked about our history as far as being abolitionists are concerned. And I went through all of this and what this means. And I read a paper. I tried to act like I was smart. And uh, do you know what one of the leading ayatollahs came up to me afterwards? He said, I can't exactly describe it, but I thought I was going to cry while you were talking. My friends, that's the Holy Spirit moving. You see, the Holy Spirit doesn't need, need visas to get into countries. <laughs> the Holy Spirit moves. And I just want to encourage you. This morning, as you look at the world, as you look at the news, God is still alive out there, and he's moving. And believe that. Don't get caught in negative news constantly. The Holy Spirit is moving. And I could stand here many stories, more stories than tell you. I was just in Saudi Arabia last, uh, a year ago, invited there by the president of the Muslim World League, the first time they'd ever had, and asked me to come there and speak about Jesus. And they invited multi-religions, yes, and multi-faith. It was the first time there'd ever been a multi-faith discussion ever on the soil of Saudi Arabia. God is at work. And, and now I've been invited to meet with him again uh, in, in the fall, some, not, not in, in Saudi, but here in the States, in another place. God is at work. So let's celebrate that and not get caught in the, oh, it's terrible. Just can't wait till Jesus comes. I can't wait till Jesus comes too, but I tell you, we got to, as he said, uh, continue to work until he comes. Continue to be at it, what we're doing. Well, let's take a look. Uh, as we look at this world and we look at the complexity and we look at the, the uh, et cetera, of all of this, it, we be, have feelings of inadequacy. Oh, there's nothing I can do. There's nothing I have. It's all too complicated. I don't want to do this. I'm just going to go home and hide. But it's interesting, as I look through Scripture, I do not find one hero of the faith that felt adequate in their own strength. It's when God calls you beyond your strength. What's in your hand? Moses is an example. Let's take a look at Moses this morning. Moses, raised in the palace. Moses knew everything, and then suddenly when he realizes what's happening with his people, the Hebrew people, he realizes this is not right. And as you know, he goes out and he sees uh, uh, one of the uh, Egyptians killing, uh, 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 treating him badly, one of the Hebrew people, and he kills the Egyptian. And then he's, then he's put out to the desert. And he's out in the desert, and he's scared. He's out there. He's out there 40 years, thinks there's no hope for me, nothing. There's nothing else. I've blown it, and there's nothing else. How many of us in our lives have said, I've blown it. All those dreams I had long ago, they're gone. I've just blown it. One day Moses is doing what he always does. And that's one of the things that I find too. God generally calls us to do something 
and surprises us in what we're just doing regular, our regular stuff, you know? But we need to be listening, our regular stuff. So he's out there taking care of the sheep, and this bush is on fire. And he goes over, and he hears God speak. And God says, you can find all this in Exodus 3 and 4. And God says, "Uh, I have heard their cry, and I've come down to rescue them. Don't you know that brought great joy to Moses' heart? Oh, finally God's going to do something. Oh, I've been praying that my people could be released from this slavery, this brutal, horrible slavery, terrible, awful. Oh, I've been praying that they could be released. Oh, thank you, God. But you know what the next word is? God says to Moses, and I'm sending you. No, 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 no. Oh, no, 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 not me. No, no, me. I can't, I, I can't do this. No, 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 I can't do this. And God continues to say, I'm sending you. And Moses says in verse, Exodus 4, verse 2, he says, he says, finally, what if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, the Lord did not appear to you? You see, he's arguing with God and saying, they're never going to believe me if I go out and say that you've told me to do this. And I love this very next word that God says to Moses. He said, Moses, what is in your hand? Now, I'm telling you, Moses, uh, my hand, a staff, a staff, a dirty old staff. It does nothing. I corral the sheep with it. I guide them with that. But it has no power. There's nothing to it. And then God says an interesting thing to Moses. He says to Moses, throw it down. And Moses throws it down. And then that staff turns into a snake. And Moses sees, it wasn't the first time he'd seen a snake by any means out there in that desert. He'd seen plenty of snakes. And then God says an absolutely ridiculous thing to him. God says, Moses, pick up that snake by the tail. Now, I grew up in Oklahoma. I know about rattlesnakes. You don't ever pick up a rattlesnake by a tail. (laughs) You don't pick them up at all, frankly. Or at least I didn't. (laughs) I ran from him. But I can imagine that Moses said, now, wait a minute, God, this is too much. You must not have been around here very long. (laughs) because you don't pick up a snake by the tail. And I can't you just hear God saying to Moses, pick it up, pick it up, pick it up. I think God speaks to us in these ways. Finally, Moses gingerly, his hand shaking, goes down and picks up that snake by the tail. And then that snake became a rod. And it literally became the rod of God. It's that rod that parted the Red Sea. It's that rod that hit the rock and water came out. It became the rod of God. What he had in his hand is what God wanted to transform, to do more than Moses ever dreamed he would ever be called to do. But then Moses has a second problem. He says, "Um, but but God, I can't speak very well. I I, I can't speak. My brother Aaron can speak a lot better than I. I I can't speak very well. And I love these words that God says in verse 12. He says, now go. I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. I want to tell you, friends, I've been in many places where I didn't know what to say. I, many places. (laughs) I well remember I was in, in Guinea, West Africa, on my way into refugee camps with the Sierra Leoneans, and I got mistaken identity. <laughs> and they thought I was smuggling Sierra Leonean rebels, and I, it was late at night, and I was with a group, and I had to go down to a dungeon. And I walked into this dungeon at, late at night to meet the Commandante, they said, and he had two guys behind him with AK-47s. 
And I'll never forget, as I stepped down those dirt steps, I looked up in the sky and I said, Lord, you are the only one. We didn't have a sat phone either. You're the only one who knows where we are. Now, I doubt that anybody here has been to Farikari Guinea. If you have, then let's talk. And uh, so, I, as I walked down that, I, just, I don't know what to say. It was exactly this. And I sensed the Lord saying, I will tell you what to say. So I walked in, and I immediately walked straight to the guy with the AK-47, and he had sunglasses on also down in that dungeon, which didn't make sense with candlelight. And I handed him my business card. <laughs> I do have a son in the, in the, in the world of, of uh, security issues. And uh, I told him that, he said, Mom, you never give a guy with an AK-47 your business card. <laughs> I said, it was the only weapon I had. And that night, God gave me what to say. And we got out and safe and et cetera, and got onto the refugee camps with our believers. And it was a wonderful, wonderful time. But I want to tell you that God uses your insecurities. He calls you to something beyond yourself. He uses your insecurities. Don't be afraid of your insecurities. He uses them. As we just saw in Moses, he uses them. And then there's a second one I want you to take a look at. And this is the widow in Elisha's time. I, I like to think uh, Elisha was uh, like the president of all the prophets or the district superintendent or whatever governance structure some churches may have. He was over all the prophets. Elisha was over all the prophets. And one of his prophets died and left behind a great deal of debt the widow, for the widow to handle. Now, with debt at that time, if she could not pay the debt, her children would then be, um, become, have to become slaves. And so she went to him and said, Elisha, I, I don't know what to do. My children are going to become slaves, and we've got a debt. I think she thought Elisha was probably going to take up an offering with all the other prophets and give her money. Th doesn't that sound reasonable to you? That's probably what I would have done if I was a leader. But Elisha does a crazy thing. He says to her, what do you have? What's in your hand? And she said, oh, Elisha, all I have is just a little bit of oil left. We're starving to death. I have just a little bit of oil. That's all I have, and it isn't even enough to make one loaf of bread. Elisha says to her, go out and find all the containers you can find. Now, she could have stopped right then and said, now that's stupid. I am not with a little bit of oil. I'm not going to do that. And this is where I think, my friends, this is where we stop. And I look back at my own life and I think, how many times did I stop and not follow on? But I look at the times that I didn't stop and followed and saw God open up far more than I ever dreamed. So she went out. She sent her kids out. They went out. They got every container they could find in the community, brought them in, and then he said to her, you can find this story in 2 Kings 4, 1 through 7 brought it into her and said, now start pouring. Pour, and she, and I, I know she thought, well, this will only fill this little container, only about that. I mean, this is, a, this is a reasonable woman, like we're all reasonable. But you know, she poured, and the oil kept pouring, and the oil kept pouring, and it filled every container that they had been able to find throughout the whole community. And then Elisha says to her, go sell that oil. You pay the debts, and you will, still, you will have enough money to raise your children. They will not be sold into slavery. My children, my friends, she had nothing in her hand but what God did to transform it. I think of a young woman that I know well in Haiti. Young woman. What did she have in her hand? And it was after the earthquake and, and still, still people living in tense cities down there. And she had the opportunity to show the Jesus film. That's all she had in her hand. And she said to me, she said, I just felt like God told me to go show the Jesus film in all these tense cities. And she said, I had a little, I had a, she had a little projector and she had a thing and she was doing it. I thought, wow. 
wow, Leah, only 80 pounds, young, out there in the middle of all of this. One night as she left, this man grabbed her, threw up against the wall, attempted to rape her. I have no idea how she got him away, and she was only 80 pounds, got him away, ran out and jumped on a motorcycle and, with her stuff and went on home. And I responded, I said, well, boy, that's terrible. Imagine you stopped, didn't you? And she said, she looked at me like, what is wrong with you? She said, no, 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 no. I went back to the same place that next night. Because there were many people that had not seen the Jesus film. And we were planting churches in all of those. She's there till today. She's married now, has children. She pastors a church. I heard from a text just the other day. She said, hi, pastor. How are you doing? I text back, doing well and praying for you. And I, these next words touch me, as you know what's going on in Haiti right now with all the gangs and the, the failed state and everything. She said, I need it more because there is much insecurity in the area of the church. And she pastors a church, she has a school, but on and off because of the gangs. It is so difficult to do ministry. This next line said, I almost, I almost was die this month, but God has control. Much prayer, thanks. I said, oh my, my, I'm so glad God spared you. She said, yeah, I hope in God. My friends, as we talk about the body of believers around the world, we talk about the body of believers here, we talk about Madison Park as a body of believers, the church. I, this next statement I want you to grasp, it is not the church that has a mission in the world, but it is God's mission that has a church in the world. That's you. We, as a body of believers, the young people going to, uh, to Ireland, the kids at middle school camp, and they're being sent. That's the church. That's God's mission in the world. He's chosen. I don't know. If I were God, I certainly probably wouldn't have chosen us. But he chose us to be his mission in the world. And then I think about the church, as we look at it, and it's interesting to me with Haiti, as I said, a failed state. There was an earthquake there a couple years ago. And this is fascinating to me. The bureau chief of the New York Times was there to do a story. And the first place she went was to a church that was, was uh, broken down and it had been destroyed. And here people were helping each other and were doing all this kind of thing. And then she went to another place as a church had been destroyed. And she said, the church is the safety net for people. I don't know what her faith is. I have no idea, but she was the bureau for the chief bureau for the New York Times for the Caribbean and Central America. And she said, I look at this. The church is the safety net for people here. They find education, health, community. It is the backbone of Haiti. Haiti's broken. I well remember after the horrible 10-year war in Sierra Leone, if you saw the movie Blood Diamonds, you know what I'm talking about. And we were very involved there, et cetera. And after that, after that war, someone declared, well, every institution is broken. Government has failed. Education has failed. Inst other institutions have failed. There is nothing that's working. Except the only institution that still remains is the church. Now, my friends, the buildings were broken, were burned. Some, there were still some left, but they were, why? It was the people of God. It was the people of God the institution of the church. And I want to say this morning, what we many times, many of you may be thinking, well, I don't even have anything in my hand. All I have is brokenness. Sriman is her name. She lived in the rural parts of Cambodia. Probably her family, early, earlier family had been killed during the killing fields time. She's illiterate, never been to school. Married at 16. And one day her husband came in and said, I'm going to take you to the city. Sriman was so excited to go to the city. She'd never seen tall buildings. She'd never even seen cars. They just got around out there with motor scooters. She wanted to see cars. She was so excited. They got to the city. They checked in at the guest house. And she waited and waited and waited for her husband to come back. Finally, she went up to the owner of the guest house. 
and said, Where is my husband? The owner of the guest house looked at her and said, Your husband sold you to me for $200. This is a brothel, and I now own you. Sriman was in that brothel four years, used and abused in some of the most horrendous ways that you can imagine. One night, miraculously, truly miraculously, she escaped. And she, you, the only way to escape is to walk right straight out where all the people are, etc. But somehow, she escaped. She'd heard that there was a home there called the White Lotus Home that would accept her if she could get out. And so she did. It was one that we, we in World Hope worked with. And when she got to the White Lotus Home, she was welcomed. She was loved. She'd never been loved before for who she was, not what somebody could get out of her. And one day she said to the owners of the guest house, she said, how do I find the real God? You see, she knew Buddhism. That was, that's the, the cultural religion of the country. How do I find the real God? See, people, I believe every single person is made with that God vacuum in them. All over the world, that's how humans are made. They're looking for the real God. They're looking for Jesus. And they began to tell her who Jesus was. She loved Jesus with all her heart. I was there a couple years later and met her, and, uh, uh, and she was teaching me how to spin cotton and weave a rug. Now, the way you spin cotton, you sit on this little can about that high. I was too tall and too fat, and I kept falling off that can all the time. And she would put her arm over on me and just look at me and laugh. And I well remember her face, her bony face. She then weighed only 80 pounds. She was dying of AIDS. There was a light in her face I could never capture on a camera. It was a light of Jesus. They told me that they had taken her to the Buddhist doctor just to get some help, to, to help with her pain and the dying of AIDS. And when he finished, she looked up at that doctor and said, I love Jesus with all my heart. And it was so powerful. That Buddhist doctor laid his head on her shoulder and started crying and said, I want to know your Jesus. What did she have in her hand? Jesus. Redemption. That's all she had. Well, I, when I was there during that particular time, I had a call from the U.S. Embassy, and the ambassador was there from the United States and wanted to have breakfast with me. And I thought, well, he needs to know about all the things that the faith-based groups are doing. A lot of us are working here, and he needs to know this. And so I told the embassy woman, I want to bring some people. Well, now, if you bring people from Canada, we can't pass. I don't care. It's my tax dollars. I should get, you know, be able to get, spend as much money as I want. And... Um, so anyway, we met. He met with people. He was very moved by what, every, what the faith-based people were doing in Cambodia regarding the whole issue of anti-human trafficking. Then he said to me, I'd like to go out and visit some of these places. Okay, so I took him. I took him out to the White Lotus home. We went to several places. As we were going back to the hotel that day, he said, that Sriman, her story really impacted me. Now, I thought then, her story is no different than anybody else's. But you know what? It was the power of the Holy Spirit in her, the power of Jesus. Well, I came back home, and then I found out that she had passed away. So I called him, and I said, I just wanted to let you know that Sriman passed away. He was very silent on the other end, and I thought, oh, I, Joanne, you've made a fool of yourself. This man's been in 190 countries. He probably doesn't even remember who it is. And then he came back to me, and he said, she really impacted me. Well, a month or so later, I got a call that there was going to be a big event at the State Department. All the diplomatic corps was going to be there, Congress people were going to be there, and it was referred to as Celebration of the Modern Day Abolitionist. And they called and said, um, Joanne, we would like, I, we've just been sitting around here thinking we'd like to open this in prayer. Would you pray? And I thought, oh my goodness, okay. Uh, I said, well, I'll, I'll write out a prayer. No, don't write it. We trust you. And I thought, well, that's dangerous, you know. Um, <laughs> So I prayed. Condoleezza Rice was the Secretary of State at that time. She spoke. Congress people spoke, and then this ambassador spoke at the end. 
And he started telling about, again, the 190 countries, all the laws are being changed, etc. But then he started, he said, but I want to tell you about someone who really impacted me. Now, I thought it would be a prime minister someplace or president. Suddenly, I realized he was telling Sriman's story. And I thought, here is this woman, illiterate, rural area, nobody even could find it, used and abused in the most horrendous ways, and her story today is impacting the most powerful people in the world. My friends, it's your brokenness. Bring your brokenness. Her brokenness was what she had. And so this morning, I just, I just sense that many of us today, we have something in our hand that we don't value. God is calling you to give that to him today. And I'm going to do something kind of weird. I don't know. I think you do it here. And that is, if you have something that you want to, something in your hand and you want to give to God, something that you do all every day, something that you have, your computer, whatever, I don't know, and you want to give it to God, I'm just going to ask you to come forward. Let's all just stand. And then, you know, as you see people up here and that you want to pray for them, come up and pray for them. Just recently, I was reading someone not from our tradition at all said, you know what, in this lonely day that we live, I think we need to have people come up and pray with each other like they'd never heard of that before. And so this morning, I just want to ask you, you have something in your hand you want to give to God. Come forward. Now is just the music plays. Just come forward. Maybe it's your brokenness you want to give to God. Come forward and give it to him. See how he wants to transform it. Feel free to just step on a little closer up to the steps. Some of you may say, my past is so broken. That's nothing. And God is saying, give it to me. I want to transform it. I want to transform others with your past, just like Sriman. If you see a friend up here that you want to come and pray with, come on up with him. I was just thinking, it hit me too. Some of you may say, well, I'm old. I've, I've done my bit. I want to tell you, as long as you're living, God still wants to use you. He still wants to work through you in ways you still have never been moved through before. I'm probably the oldest person in this room. And I keep being stunned at what God keeps doing. Lord Jesus, you see this group here this morning. Lord, I cannot even imagine what you want to do with what they're bringing to you. I can't imagine how Anderson, the city, can be transformed.
with what you want to do through them. I can't imagine how the state of Indiana can be transformed. I can't imagine how the rest of the world can be transformed because that's what you've called us to be your people at this time and for the last 2,000 years. I can't imagine the people that will come to Jesus through this group that's right here in front when they thought they were finished and yet you want to bring more and more. I can't imagine. I can't imagine how you want to transform this church <laughs> till there will be no more room in this place. I just see this, this packed and no more room and people waiting to get in, Lord, because you're present. People want this, finding new life, finding new hope. And as Heather's on vacation, Lord, touch her, anoint her in special ways today. May she return with the great uh, vision more than she's ever had. Because it's your vision, not hers, it's your vision. So Lord, today, we lift every one of these people here. Here's what's in our hand, Lord. We're throwing it down so that you can make it powerful. You can do more than we can ever ask, think, or imagine. I thank you this morning, Lord, that you're looking down here at Madison Park Church of God, and you're seeing every person that's here, and you are moving in ways that we can't see but you're doing it. You're moving. You're working when we can't see it, but you're working. And not for anyone's glory, but for your glory, to bring glory to you in this time, in this earth, and glory to you throughout the world and throughout the ages as we shout, Jesus is Lord. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. My dear friends here at the front, go with his blessing. Go with his love. Go with his courage. And step out. And he will be there. Amen.